Good morning, it's April 11th here in Seoul and I'm Kim Dami. We begin with these stories making the headlines at this hour with Washington reaffirming its commitment to security and commitment to South Korea, calling it ironclad. The U.S. State Department says that Washington is in talks with its allies to reassure them of the U.S. defense commitments. In response to the leaking of classified Pentagon documents that suggest the U.S. may have been snooping on South Korea's top office. The World Bank has revised its global economy outlook from 1.7 percent to 2 percent, pointing out China's lifting of COVID lockdowns and better-than-expected performances of advanced economies. And here in the country, the Bank of Korea is likely to opt for another rate freeze at the current 3.5 percent, with signs that inflation is being tamed. Regarding its leaked military documents, the U.S. says it's working to reassure its allies and partners, calling its commitment to South Korea ironclad. Now, this comes as another document, this time showing SARS a plan to deliver artillery shells has been found online. Our Song Yujin leads our coverage this morning. The United States says it is engaging with allies and partners regarding the recent leak of its highly classified military documents. The leak has been causing alarm around the world as some documents show the U.S. could have been eavesdropping on key allies like Israel and South Korea. U.S. officials uh, uh, across the interagency are engaging with allies and partners at high levels over this, including to reassure them of our commitment to safeguarding intelligence and uh, the fidelity of securing our partnerships as well. When asked about how the leak could impact South Korea-U.S. relations, the spokesperson said Washington's commitment towards Seoul remains ironclad. He went on to emphasize that South Korea is one of Washington's most important partners in the Indo-Pacific region. But concerns are growing in South Korea as another document related to the country has been found online. On Monday, local media outlets reported on a printed document titled ROK-155 Delivery Timeline. The one-page document, dated February 27th, includes a 72-day timeline of when and how South Korea will deliver 330,000 artillery shells. Though it does not mention the final destination of the 155-millimeter shells, a previously leaked conversation between President Yoon Seok-yeol's then-Secretary for Foreign Affairs and his national security adviser suggests it could be Ukraine. Citing the leaked documents, the New York Times detailed the two advisers' conversation where the Foreign Affairs Secretary expresses concern that the U.S. would not be the end user if South Korea complies with its request for ammunition. In February, the U.S. had reportedly inquired about purchasing ammunition from South Korea, but Seoul was worried about supplies reaching Ukraine and going against its long-standing policy of not supplying weapons to countries at war. The National Security Advisor then suggests selling 330,000 rounds of 155-millimeter artillery shells to Ukraine's neighbor Poland as a roundabout solution to the issue. Seoul's defense ministry declined to provide any specific details regarding this matter, saying that the Korean and American governments are discussing ways to support and protect Ukraine's freedom. Song Yujin, Arirang News. Seoul and Washington are set to kick off annual defense talks with enhancing deterrence against North Korea likely to top the agenda. According to Seoul's Defense Ministry on Tuesday, the Korea-U.S. Integrated Defense and Dialogue, or KIDD, will take place in Washington, D.C. on Tuesday and Wednesday. The South Korean side will be led by Deputy Minister for Defense Policy Ho tae and the U.S. side will be headed by Eli Ratner, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Indo-Pacific Security Affairs, and Siddharth Mohandas, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for East Asia. Following the meeting, Seoul, Washington and Tokyo, in a separate meeting, will discuss sharing missile warning data in real time to counter the North's threats. 
North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has once again ordered his military to ramp up war deterrence capabilities. According to North Sea-run media on Tuesday, Kim presided over an enlarged meeting of the Central Military Commission of the Ruling Workers' Party of Korea on Monday where he stressed the need for a practical and aggressive expansion of war deterrence, presumably referring to nuclear capabilities. The report says the meeting was convened following what it claims are increased threats posed by the aggressive acts and policies of South Korea and the U.S. The regime held such military meetings in February and March, which is considered a rare move as the North normally carries out the meeting roughly every six months. Seeing on the Korean Peninsula, North Korea hasn't answered the daily inter-Korean phone calls from the South for the fourth straight day. Now, the absence of response is presumed to be intentional. Our Choi min -jung explains what may be the reason behind this. North Korea has on Monday remained unresponsive to routine calls with South Korea for the fourth day in a row. Accordingly, Seoul believes Pyongyang has unilaterally cut all communication. During the weekend, the North did not respond via the military communication line, and this morning there was no response from the liaison office and the military communication line. For now, we are putting more weight on the possibility of a unilateral blockade by the North. The Unification Ministry on Monday added it will review how to respond while monitoring the situation closely. The inter-Korean liaison communication channel and a military hotline are normally used twice a day, but there has been no response via either since Friday. It is unclear why the North remains unresponsive, but an expert says Pyongyang's move appears to be in protest of the ongoing security cooperation between Seoul and Washington. So it's another way of North Korea issuing stern warning to United States and South Korea that uh, it does not appreciate the augmented security cooperation between the two countries, especially the ongoing and uh, elevated uh, security cooperation and military exercises. The expert did point out, however, that this measure should not be regarded as the North's determination to carry out a substantial measure of retaliation or provocation, as it may only be a warning. The ministry adds this is the first time that calls have stopped for longer than a day since communications were restored in October 2021. Prior to that period, North Korea had cut off cross-border communication for about two months in protest of the Seoul-Washington joint military drills. Choi min -jung, Arirang News. According to the latest report from the IAEA, Japan's Fukushima water monitoring is reliable to a large extent, but we do have some worrisome unresolved matters. Now, how safe is it to release the contaminated water, and how has Japan prepared for this? For more, we're joined by Professor Sagun Yer from Sara National University. Welcome to the program. Good morning to you. Good morning. First off, the recent IAEA report pointed out that Tokyo still needs to address some lingering concerns regarding the water release plan. Now, Professor, walk us through the report briefly. What are those concerns? Okay, before getting into that report, let me start off by saying that uh, there are two more reports in the pipeline, first of all. And second of all, that report number four tastes like a thin soup. There were no real chunks of meat, but at least several bullet items caught my eyes. First of all, mm -hmm. the calculation was the so-called source term is relating to what kind of materials, radical materials are in there, but they forgot to mention the extended calculation during the later part of the accident. They just stuck at the moment of accident, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. The other thing has to do with the ALPS processing system. The agency simply assumed that everything is all right. Looks like uh, ALPS has two uh, components. One is uh, precipitator, the other is adsorber, ADSRB, absorption and adherence. And they sort of assume that everything is okay. And they conclude that the list is uh, pretty much comprehensive as well as realistic. I don't buy that idea. And third of all, there was a mention of uh, environmental assessment 
radiological environmental impact assessment. And the area APCO looked at was pretty much restricted, just uh, 270 kilometers east-west and 470 kilometers north-south. Mm -hmm. It's just too restricted. It has to be as wide as uh, at least 8,000 kilometers from Tokyo to San Francisco or 10,000 kilometers from Tokyo to LA. So, but that they, the agents didn't mention this mm. either. So in that regard, again, the report tastes like a thin soap. Right. The, the area itself is very restricted. Mm -hmm. Now, it looks like it'll be almost inevitable uh, for Japan. Well, not inevitable, but it looks like Japan will push ahead with the releasing of the water this spring. Now, what steps mm -hmm. or procedures does Japan need to take now before actually releasing the water? I mean, what's on top of their to-do list to ensure it is safe? I'd like them to go back to the time of the accident to double check mm -hmm. on the source term, what kind of materials, radic materials, and how much of it is included in the processed water. They try to process it, but it's not quite processed yet. Three quarters of the radic materials are still in there, then it's radioactive. And the situation is pretty much worse than they thought. So they have to go back to the drawing board and do their homework again. But I don't think they're going to do that. And also, this IEA report is just an advisory report. It's got no executive power. It's really the nuclear regulatory authority situated in Tokyo, Japan. Mm -hmm. They are the ones to let it go. And they already gave TEPCO or Tokyo Electric the green light many times. So they're going to go with this plan, regardless right. of the result or final verdict of the final version of the report. Now, Professor. Right. Going back to last week, South Korean President Yoon suk has stressed no seafood linked to Fukushima will be allowed uh -huh. into the country. Now, how possible is this plan? Can we really prevent that seafood from flowing into here in the country? Uh, Actually, I have no idea what he was talking about. Maybe it's just lip service, or maybe he's a genius. Because once the genius, Jenny, actually is out of the bottle, there is no way to get her back in. So once the discharge or dumping is started, then there's no way that we can stay away from the pollution coming from either the current or the fishery or basically the oyster farm, team farm, and salt farm. So there's no way around. I'm not quite sure what he was really alluding to. Right. All right, Professor Saw, thank you so much for joining us and your insight this morning. My pleasure. The World Bank has revised its 2023 global economic outlook from 1.7% to 2%. Reasons behind the improvement include an improved forecast for China's recovery from COVID-19 lockdowns. But the chiefs of global the World Bank and the IMF warn geopolitical tensions will put a heavy burden on the economy and trade. Our Lee sin has more. With the World Bank's and International Monetary Fund's spring meetings kicking off on Monday, World Bank Group President David Malpass says the global lender has revised its 2023 global growth outlook slightly upwards. Speaking at a media briefing on the same day, Malpass says the World Bank revised its 2023 growth forecast from the previous 1.7 percent to 2 percent, mainly due to an improved outlook for China's recovery from COVID-19 lockdowns. The World Bank chief also noted that advanced economies like the U.S. and those in Europe are faring a bit better than the World Bank anticipated in their January Global Economic Prospects report. 
However, Mao Pass also warned that volatility in the banking sector and higher oil prices could yet again put downward pressure on growth prospects in the second half of 2023. He also noted that a slowdown from stronger 2022 global economic growth will increase debt distress for developing countries. During the session with Mao Pass and IMF Managing Director Kristalina Gargeva, the two chiefs pointed out that geopolitical conflicts, like the situation in Ukraine, are putting a heavy burden on the economy and trade. Gergeva went as far as to say that the division caused by geopolitical conflicts is one of the biggest challenges the world economy needs to solve. Malpass, on the other hand, raised concerns over developing countries which have experienced capital outflows due to interest rate hikes. He also added that developing countries are suffering greatly from debt burdens, climate change, rising food prices, and slowing growth. Global economic issues will continue to be discussed during the 2023 spring meetings of the World Bank Group and the International Monetary Fund, which takes place from April 10th to the 16th in Washington, D.C. Lee seung Arirang News. In the coming hour, the Bank of Korea will decide on the country's key interest rate and is highly likely to opt for another rate freeze. Economists and financial experts widely believe the central bank is likely to freeze a rate at the current 3.5 percent, taking into consideration inflation, which has fallen into the low 4 percent range, as well as the economic downturn. If the key rate remains as it is, it will be the second straight month that the central bank has a frozen the rate. It also means the gap between the BOK and the U.S. Fed will remain at 1.5 percent, the largest interest rate reversal since October 2000. Now, South Korea will pour over $10 billion into key sectors, including chips and secondary batteries for the next seven years. The ambitious plan is to bridge the technological gap between rivals while maximizing production. Our Moon Hedian tells us more. South Korea's Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy held a roundtable on Monday with chief technology officers from nine South Korean firms, including Samsung Display, Hyundai Motor and POSCO, to discuss investment plans for the year ahead. The government announced that it will be spending 70 percent of its annual budget for research and development across 40 different projects in 11 key investment areas, those being semiconductors, displays, secondary batteries, feature mobility, core materials, advanced manufacturing, robots, aerospace and defense, advanced bio, next generation nuclear power, and new energy industries. The ministry explained that the public and private sectors will be working together to establish clear goals and investment directions for each sector and focus their investment on selected strategic projects. In the past, the government faced criticism for its unclear approach to investments in research and development, but through collaboration with the private sector, it hopes that it will be able to invest wisely. Furthermore, a project manager group will be formed to manage the process of technological development, commercialization and talent development. With the slump in the semiconductor industry amid falling semiconductor prices and the economic slowdown affecting exports, the government plans to invest in four semiconductor projects to revitalize the industry. These include developing semiconductors for mobility, energy and home appliances, as well as pursuing semiconductor technology development projects for autonomous vehicles. As of Monday, the government has identified 34 projects to invest in. This will later be expanded to 40 projects after further consultation with experts. Moon Hedeon, Arirang News. Good morning, I'm Matthew Ashley, and we now turn over to stories from around the world. We begin in the United States, where at least four people have been killed and nine wounded in a mass shooting at a bank. The shooting happened in the state of Kentucky in Louisville on Monday local time. Three of the wounded are in critical condition. The gunman was using a rifle and was shot and killed by responding police officers. He was identified as a 23-year-old bank employee who had recently found out he would be fired. He is said to have left a note to family and friends suggesting his intention to carry out the shooting 
and live-streamed the attack. Kentucky passed a law in March prohibiting its state and local authorities from enforcing any federal restrictions related to firearms. Turning over to the war in Ukraine, Kyiv and Moscow have exchanged over 200 troops in the latest prisoner swap. According to both countries, the swap took place on Monday local time, but it's not known how it was carried out. It saw 100 Ukrainian and 106 Russian soldiers returned home. Officials from both sides say that their soldiers are in bad shape and are being treated for injuries and receiving rehabilitation. Ukrainian officials allege that some of their troops were also tortured, while Russian officials say their servicemen were in mortal danger in Ukrainian captivity. Meanwhile, in France, five bodies have been pulled from the rubble of a collapsed building in the city of Marseille amid ongoing search and rescue efforts. Three people are still missing. The building came down after an explosion on Sunday morning, local time, which authorities say was likely caused by a gas leak. The explosion also damaged nearby buildings, causing two to partially collapse a few hours later. Initial rescue efforts were hampered by dust and heat from the fire, which took a crew of 100 firefighters hours to extinguish. The disaster marks the second time in five years that a building has collapsed in the port city. In November 2018, eight people were killed when two houses collapsed due to structural issues. And finally, Sky News Australia is quitting TikTok. The news outlet reported Monday that it would stop publishing videos on its account, leaving behind its 65,000 followers. It cited security concerns as the main reason, alleging that the platform takes data from its users. It comes after TikTok's parent company, ByteDance, fired four employees in December 2022 for accessing the personal data of two journalists working for the Financial Times and BuzzFeed. TikTok has already been banned from official devices used by employees of several governments and organizations over allegations that the app is controlled by Beijing. But TikTok maintains that the Chinese government has no control over the app. Good morning. From yesterday's pleasant windy weather to storm force day in store, it looks to be quite windy with a wind advisory already being issued in the east and west coast regions as well as the capital area. Now, mountainous regions in Kaungdo province will have typhoon force winds of 110 kilometers an hour. So it could be difficult to stand without holding on to something and even cars will not be able to drive at normal speed. So please, let's all be careful today and take it easy. Along with violent winds, rain is in the forecast. Central regions will see light rain spreading to the rest of the country by the afternoon. And try not to get wet by today's rain. It's very likely that the rain will be mixed with yellow dust today. A strong umbrella is a must or have your raincoat ready to avoid that dusty rain. Now, morning temperatures are 5 to 9 degrees higher than the same time yesterday. Highs will be slightly lower in central regions but will go up as high as Monday in southern parts of the country. That's Korea for you and here's a look at the international weather conditions.
That is all we have for today's New Day at Arirang. We'll be back tomorrow for Wednesday's edition at the same time. Thanks for watching.